Hello, my name is Dr. Julie Christensen. I'm a second year psychiatry resident at Mayo Clinic, and I'm excited to present to you tonight about transgender mental health. I know things are a little bit different this year using Zoom, and I'm sorry that I can't be there in person with you all, but I'm excited to present this topic to you, and I would love to hear questions or comments if you'd like to email me. Um, I'll have my contact information at the end of this presentation. Thank you for having me tonight. This is really an honor to present to you, and I hope that I can share some helpful and important topics with you. I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to share. So for tonight, and please allow me to move my little video here to the corner. Um, for tonight, I'd like to define common terminology related to sexual and gender identity. I'd also like to outline the developmental timeline of gender identity in a person's life. And then I'll review gender in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the main um, diagnostic criteria that we use in psychiatry and psychology. It's also called the DSM. Next, I'll highlight some research that I've been working on related to transgender and mental health. And then I'll talk about some practical ways that we can all support and include transgender people. So first, we'll talk about some terminology. Many of you may have heard your friends or family use a number of these different terms. I know they can be quite confusing for some people, so we can go through in detail what each of these terms mean. I'm gonna move myself again here so that you can read these words. The first term here on the list on the left is sex. This refers to the anatomic ex expression or the, the physiology of somebody's body. This is often also described as sex assigned at birth. It's typically based on the um, the anatomic features that are observed in a baby when they're born. So that's why here you can see that this description is pointing to a person's uh, genitalia. Next, we talk about gender. This is more, and I'll move up here, more to a way that the person internally feels. This is the way that somebody might identify would be their gender identity. It's an internal sense of being male, female, or something else. It can change throughout somebody's life. And it's helpful to think of some of these terms, well, many of them really, on a continuum. So, um, you know, often things on a continuum um, have binary ends. So in the um, relation to gender and sex, that may be male and female, but there's many variations in between. And as far as gender, this can change throughout the course of somebody's lifetime. Next, we have sexual orientation. This refers to attraction. So here we see the word attraction pointing to this gender-bred person's heart. So this refers to who you are attracted to, would be your sexual orientation. As I talked about before, gender identity. This is the sense of who you are, um, male or female, and then gender expression. The reason why I wrote out here gender identity and gender expression is because somebody may feel that they are male or that they are female or that they are non-binary. They may feel a certain gender, but they may outwardly express, meaning what they wear, the clothing that they wear, how they keep their hair, different um, makeup or things like this, um, the way that they present themselves may be different than the way that they identify. There are many reasons that somebody might present differently than they identify. And oftentimes this goes back to safety, social acceptance, um, or perhaps it is, it is a preference of the person. 
The next word I have here on the list is transition. Now, this word, I think, can mean many different things. It can mean a social transition for a child, so changing from um, presenting in their classroom as female to changing to presenting as male. Um, and they may simply do this by asking their friends and teachers and family to call them a different name. Transitioning can also be something like coming to the transgender and intersex clinic here at Mayo Clinic and being referred to have a type of surgery. There are really a very long list of surgeries that people might have in order to bring their physical body in line with their internal sense of their gender. So it's really hard to give a specific definition of what transition might mean. And it really looks different for everybody, depending on what they need in order for their outward expression or their social sense of belonging to match their identity. The next word is transgender. This is the um, commonly used terminology today that refers to somebody who um, has an incongruence or a difference between their sex assigned at birth and their gender identity. And oftentimes you'll hear people refer to this as trans. Um, that's a kind of a short, um, a short way of referring to, um, typically people are, are um, referring to transgender term. Next would be gender non-binary. This is a newer term, um, at least in my knowledge. Um, and it's one that refers to somebody who exists somewhere on the spectrum outside of male or female. So they, um, they may not identify as any gender, or I think a more common way of, of phrasing this would be they identify as neither male nor female. And this would be gender non-binary. Next thing that you'll hear people talk about are pronouns. So this is a very important topic, and it's important because it shows that you are supporting and acknowledging somebody's internal gender identity and their preference for how they would like to be referred to. Pronouns that you'll most often hear will be she or her. Those are my preferred pronouns. Pronouns that you may also hear will be he, him, or his. And another common pronoun is they, them, or theirs. Typically, they, them, or theirs will be used by somebody who does not either identifies as gender non-binary or does not have a strong preference for which pronoun is used to refer to them. Um, specifically, doesn't have a preference between male or female. Um, some people are okay with the use of any pronouns. Other people have a very specific idea and a specific need to have certain pronouns used when referring to them. I wish I could take questions right now, but we'll move on to the next section. Next, we will talk about gender development. So I've written out a timeline here, and this is according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And they have a whole chapter, which we'll go over in more detail, that talks about um, gender dysphoria. So this timeline is specific to a child who may be experiencing gender dysphoria. And it certainly does not represent all, all children um, or all people who experience gender dysphoria. Um, this, this spectrum or this illness can present in many, many different ways, but I would say this is um, the most common um, way that it will present in terms of timeline. So around two years old, children will begin expressing gendered behaviors and gendered interests. This may mean spending time with 
peers of certain gender. It may mean participating in certain activities that are typical of a certain gender. It may be preferring to dress um, according to certain gender. Around two to four years old, um, children who are referred to gender clinics typically show an onset of cross-gender behaviors. So that's the behaviors that I just described. By four to six years of age, some preschool age children um, will show both these be uh, cross-gender behaviors as well as they will verbalize or express the desire to be the other gender. And less commonly, but importantly, some children will say that they are the other gender. So these are important distinctions that we look for in clinical practice when working with children who are transgender or who are experiencing gender dysphoria. Next, um, from six to 12 years old, Distress might not manifest if the child is in a social environment where they are supported in their gender, but the distress might manifest quite strongly in environments where somebody is not supported. So you can see that in this age range, it really, is somebody's experience is very influenced by their environment. By puberty, expression, expressions of anatomic dysphoria are more common and salient in, in adolescents and older adults, and it's because of the onset of the development of secondary sex characteristics. So this can be quite, um, quite traumatic for children who are experiencing, or young adults who are experiencing gender dysphoria, because it means the onset of a puberty that they don't align with and that they would prefer not to go through. Um, and oftentimes puberty is a time where we see a lot of internalizing um, uh, disorders within psychiatry and psychology, things like depression, anxiety, um, as well as attempts at suicide and uh, self-injury. Next, in adult life, um, people with gender dysphoria, along with those with an atypical gender expression in general, might experience high levels of stigmatization, discrimination, and victimization. So this is why it's really important to, um, to focus on the way that society um, treats and um, hopefully you know, over time continues to welcome people who have diverse and different um, gender expressions and experiences. Finally, with older adults, um, and the reason I haven't gone into a lot of detail about the time course for different people's lives is that it just is so different between different people and what they need um, and what they, um, you know, will make them um, happy and um, comfortable um, in their, their lives and bodies. So with transgender elders, it's really an underserved and understudied uh, population. So I don't have a lot of um, data that I can bring, but it is found that um, persistence of gender dysphoria, um, or I shouldn't say it's found, it's um, another area of, of um, understudied um, is in this rates of persistence of gender dysphoria from childhood into adulthood. Um, and a lot of the studies that are referenced in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual talk about there being um, a really a broad range um, from 12 to 50 percent is a, a range that I um, read. And so it's not, you know, I, I don't think it's a uh, well enough understood area um, for us to know exactly um, how many people um, continue to feel feelings of gender dysphoria from, from their youth into adulthood. Okay, next we have the, um, a bit more about the epidemiology um, of this community. So approximately 1,300 people per every 100,000 or about 1.3% of people identify as transgender. Um, a study conducted in 2011, which was a, a national survey here in the United States, showed that 19% of transgender people are refused healthcare. 
And this can be due to many reasons. One, large, one big reason is that um, medicine for the transgender community is not taught in medical school. And as such, when providers see transgender patients, they may not feel comfortable um, treating their specific condition. But this is um, really a, a large problem in access to care because people who are transgender suffer from the same conditions that everybody else suffers from. And their gender identity and gender expression really affects very, um, very few physical health conditions. So it's very important for us to normalize transgender identity and to ensure that the, um, all of medical providers are comfortable working with this population. 28% of transgender people have been verbally harassed in medical settings. Again, I think that this goes back to um, just this unfamiliarity um, with the community and um, you know, really a, a society that has unfortunately normalized the discrimination against this community. 50% of transgender patients report having to educate their provider about transgender health care. And there are higher rates of mental health concerns. And it's been found that these are the mental rates of mental health concerns are largely due to the social factors. So as I talked about in that six to 12 year old age range, um, children really being who are supported in their environments really do well and, and um, have rates of anxiety and depression and suicidality that are comparable to cisgender kids. Um, but when in environments that are not supportive, um, then that's when we really see rates of mental health concerns rise. Looking also at um, more about social conditions, um, a study conducted at the University of Minnesota in 2013 found that out of a sample of over a thousand transgender respondents, about 37% had trouble finding work, 23% had lost a job, um, if we continue down here, 20, about 24% has, had experienced some sort of physical assault, and then about 70% have experienced verbal abuse in their lifetime. And then sexual abuse was about 15%. So this is a, really a community that has experienced a lot of trauma and a lot of hardship in our society. I'm just going to check my time here. One second. Okay. Next, we'll move on to talk about gender in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And as I said, this is the, here it is, this is the text that we use as um, psychiatrists and psychologists. And we use this in order to make diagnoses. And then those diagnoses can help us plan out therapies and treatments and um, plans for best supporting our patients. So here we have quite a, a long uh, list of words and terms here. So I won't go through this exhaustively, but what I think is really important to point out is that gender dysphoria, and there's an entire chapter in this edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that's devoted to talking about gender dysphoria. And this chapter is divided into um, uh, diagnostic criteria for children and then diagnostic criteria for adults and adolescents. So first looking at the criteria for children, um, I think what's most important here is the text that I've highlighted in blue. And what's, what I wanna point out is that the, in order to meet criteria for gender dysphoria, you need to have a marked incongruence between your experienced and expressed gender and your assigned gender. So I might even adjust this language to say assigned sex, um, because as we talked about before, sex is assigned and is based on somebody's um, um, body and their um, presentation at birth and what genitalia they have specifically. Um, so we're seeing an incongruence between somebody's gender or their sense of being male, female, or something else, and then their assigned sex at birth. And then this 
incongruence needs to last at least a six months duration. So all of our diagnoses, we have very specific uh, time courses that we need to, um, to assess for. And then people need to have at least six of the following um, of these, this list of, of um, criteria. So in general, um, and I hope that you can read the text, I know it might be small on your screens, but in general, um, the patient has a strong desire to be of the other gender and an insistence or an insistence that one is the other gender. I won't go down all of this, but a couple of the other points say a strong preference for cross-gender roles in make-believe play or fantasy play. They may have a strong preference for toys, games, or activities that are stereotypically used or engaged in by the other gender. They might have a strong preference for playmates of the other gender. And then um, you, they may have a strong dislike of their sexual anatomy. So this you, you may see in children, especially as they're getting more toward adolescence. Um, I would say that it comes much more strongly when we hit puberty, as we talked about this, um, specifically the dislike of one's anatomy, sexual anatomy. All right. And then the last point here talks about that this condition is associated with clinically significant distress or impairment. And we can talk a bit more about what that might look like. Now, this is the criteria for adults, adolescents and adults. It does look very similar to the criteria for children. Um, you won't see some of the references to play or to fantasy um, that you saw in the child criteria, um, but you see the same, that it's also a marked incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and their assigned gender or sex, and at least six months duration. And then many of the same um, strong desire for um, for um, having secondary sex characteristics that align with their desired gender. Um, again, we'll touch on this clinically significant distress or impairment. So this is really important um, because this would, um, you know, they talk about in social, occupational, other important areas of functioning. So if somebody is so distressed by um, you know, needing or being forced to use a bathroom at school that they don't, um, they don't feel aligns with their gender, um, then they may start avoiding school or work setting where this may be the case. Um, and then that can impact their social and occupational functioning um, and their, really their ability to thrive. Um, so that's, those are the sorts of really disruptive um, um, destructive um, impacts of this distress. Um, and it's when, when we see those that we um, are more likely to, to make the gender dysphoria diagnosis. Then there's also a specifier here um, that says post-transition. So this, uh, I think, is a specifier that is intended to say if somebody has achieved um, achieved, or it says here, living full-time in their desired gender. Um, I think that this is difficult um, for some people to assess because it's such a fluid um, and ever-changing um, experience, and there may never be a time where you're post-transition. It may be a lifelong sort of journey or um, a lifelong process of exploration and of um, you know, coming to, to that point of, of resolve. Um, on the other hand, there are some people who certainly achieve that sense of resolve um, with very specific interventions. Um, and we'll go into some of the different um, intervention options in a bit. I'm going to check the time one more time here. Okay. So next we can talk about some current research that I've been working on. This is a project that I'll be presenting at this upcoming World Professional Association for Transgender Health Conference. 
This year, like most things, the conference will be virtual. So we'll be um, presenting the poster and a virtual conference for people to view all over the world, which is pretty exciting in its own way. Um, the conference will take place in November. The study that we have conducted is called Protective Factors for Gender Minority Youth Experiencing Suicidality. And we did a systematic review of the literature. I worked with two medical students as well as a consultant in the Department of Psychiatry, Dr. McKean. And I also um, want to acknowledge the research librarian, Dana Gerberi, as well as Dr. Murad, who is, has a lot of experience in systematic reviews. Dr. Bostwick in the Department of Psychiatry, and then Mayo Clinic does have an LGBT research group, which has advised on this project as well. Okay. So a couple of points to add that were a part of the background of um, informing the study. We know that transgender and gender non-binary people experience suicidal ideation and suicide attempts at significantly higher rates than their cisgender peers. I can tell you from my experience on in the inpatient psychiatry service that this is certainly true. Um, we have an inpatient service that typically has about 15 to 20 children and adolescents and very, very frequently we'll have transgender and gender non-binary kids who are inpatient following um, suicide attempts or with strong um, suicidal ideation. Um, also, 5% of the US population has attempted suicide in their life, whereas 40% of transgender adults report having attempted a suicide attempt. So it, it certainly is a crisis within this population, and it's something that I think we need to pay a lot of attention to and find ways um, to really lower these rates of suicidality. Um, so that's a large part of why we did this study. All right. There we go. That took a moment there. Okay. So I know that this slide is probably hard to read some of these numbers, so I'll say them here. Um, but on the left here, this uh, flow diagram, it is uh, part of the PRISMA protocol, which many of you may be familiar with, um, but it, it is for systematic reviews in order to report out how many papers you've reviewed and then how many were included in the ultimate um, uh, study. So we started out, our uh, research librarian collected 1,889 articles. Those were um, uh, sifted through and duplicates were removed. We ended up with 910 articles that we screened through. Of these in the screening process, 626 were excluded. And then we ultimately, I'll go down, we included uh, 22 studies in this information that I'm going to present next. So that you know, some of our inclusion criteria was that the studies had to be published from 2000 on or later. Um, they needed to be, or they could be from a, an international um, pool. And they needed to include information about people ages 24 and younger and they needed to mention the gender and sex very um, clearly. And they also needed to um, have uh, suicidality as one of the measures. So here this pie chart is um, talks about evidence-based interventions to prevent suicide in transgender youth. So right, here you can see that there are um, many different um, intervention types that have been proven to reduce rates of suicidality in transgender youth. These include the blue, blue piece of the pie here is medical interventions. And then there's psychiatric or psychological interventions, which is the green, family system interventions, online media, 
interventions, and then safety and connectedness. So working around um, building communities in schools, as well as anti-bullying, that sorts of that sort of intervention would be in our safety and connectedness uh, domain. After reviewing all of these articles, um, we found that suicidality is, as we've talked about, is really a major concern amongst transgender and gender non-binary youth. And we also found that the psychosocial risk factors um, do increase and influence the risk for suicidality. So it's not the, um, it's not having gender dysphoria itself that necessarily increases risk of suicidality. Rather, it's oftentimes the psychosocial um, milieu that um, comes to um, unfortunately influence um, oftentimes in a very difficult way people's lives. Um, and that's really what influences um, you know, thoughts of suicide or attempts. And with this, we found that it's very imperative to intervene early in somebody's life in order to create an environment that's livable. So we found that rates of suicide really begin to rise around age 13. And this is consistent with earlier findings of um, looking at the kind of onset of puberty as being um, really uh, correlated with the onset also of suicidality. And so it's important to intervene before this stage and to really give people all of the support and I'll talk in a bit about what those supports can look like, but give people all the supports that they need so that they find that their life can be livable. Um, all right, I think I've covered that last uh, bullet point there. So the last section that I would like to review with you is going over some of the clinical care that we offer to transgender young people and well, transgender people of all ages really, um, as well as talk about some practical tips for supporting people who are transgender. So I think the easiest thing that we can all do um, is adjust our everyday language in order to um, create really an inclusive um, way of speaking and of interacting with other people. So one way that you can do this is you can try out terms such as referring to a grandchild as, um, you know, if you're talking to, to your kid about your grandchildren, say, how are the grandkids doing? Or how is my grandchild doing? Um, this is one way that you can really, um, you know, take away the um, sort of the assumption that somebody may be one gender or another and open up that somebody could for themselves define what their gender is. Um, and to, to communicate that that is um, acceptable to you. Another way would be to um, refer to your spouse as your spouse or as a partner. This is a way also to, um, you know, if, if you'd like to, you can um, sure that you have a wife or a husband, but keeping the language as neutral as possible um, it can then open up to other people that, oh, it doesn't necessarily um, you know, affect this relationship, my friendship, um, if this person has a spouse of the same sex or the same gender. Um, so it's a way, this really for the whole LGBT community as well, um, is a way to be inclusive. And then the last thing is that using the, the pronoun they can be, it's considered gender neutral. And um, it can be a way if you don't know the pronoun of somebody to refer to, to them. Um, so an example of this might be, they're wearing a backpack or do you see that person? They just walked down the street. So it, it can, for some people, it can be difficult to use this pronoun, especially if we're used to using his or hers um, for our whole whole um, lives. Um, but it's one, one thing that we can incorporate into our kind of everyday um, language that can signify to, especially to transgender people, that um, their gender is not the only thing that we are focused on. Okay, 
So this is where I'll get into some more of the details of what the ways that we um, can support transgender people and help to create a, a world and an environment that makes life worth living. So we have um, in the top left here, health as the first intervention. And um, I guess I should point out the title of this slide is more than medical. So as I've talked about, there's all of these different interventions that have been proven to be effective in reducing suicidality. And that includes medical and healthcare interventions, but it also includes interventions in the family system, at home, and at school. So that's why we really want to um, take this all-encompassing all approach. So um, starting out here in the top left, we have healthcare. So I think it's very important that we start to identify and support transgender and gender non-binary. That's what I uh, have abbreviated here as TGNB youth early by screening all children. So this may be asking children, are you a boy or a girl? Um, rather than assuming that their gender aligns with the sex that we have assigned them at birth. Um, and even a more inclusive way of asking that question might be, are you a boy or a girl or something else or, or another gender? Um, I'm sure there are many different ways that we can ask this question more effectively than what I've presented here. Um, then in, in the same realm, we can train pediatricians to ask about gender, as I, I mentioned. And then if somebody does express a gender that's different than their sex assigned at birth, that's when we can refer to specialty clinics. So here at Mayo Clinic, we now have the Transgender and Intersex Specialty Care Clinic. This is housed in largely within the Department of Endocrinology, but they are, it's a multidisciplinary clinic, and they work with family medicine, psychiatry, psychology, surgery, um, and they really provide um, specialty consultation, specifically looking at um, gender and sex and uh, ways that we can support people in um, you know, aligning their gender or their sex with their internal um, sense of gender. Um, next, empowering primary care providers to provide longitudinal gender affirming medical care. So this is kind of goes back to that piece where I talked about how so many transgender people have, have um, reported that they have needed to inform their healthcare providers about really about their existence and about um, their life. And I think that we as a medical community can certainly take up some of that work of educating our future, future generations and our providers and communities. Um, other medical interventions that I haven't um, talked about here uh, would be, um, you know, there's, as I talked about, there's so many different ways that people might um, experience it, their transition, um, and that it's really not one thing, but um, some things that people do um, for children, you can um, put a stop on puberty. So this is by using, it's called GnRH um, agonists. And it, um, it essentially is um, stopping or putting a pause on their development of secondary sex characteristics. Um, so um, then once the um, child is ready and once kind of the social uh, structures have been put in place, then the puberty may be allowed to continue um, or there may be in, um, interventions such as cross-sex hormones. So this can be um, providing testosterone or estrogen and progesterone to people in order for their um, hormones to match their internal sense of gender. Other interventions might include surgeries. The surgeries are beyond the scope of my talk today, but there are many different um, surgical interventions that allow somebody's physical body to align with their gender. All right, um, and as I said, there's many other interventions that people may um, may pursue, um, and really, it's a, a week long conference would be <laughs> not even enough to go through all of the different um, options. So next, we'll talk about um, interventions for home, 
So I think that it, it could be very beneficial to start teaching about gender diversity as early as in parenting classes. So this can be, you know, before even new parents have a new baby, they can start talking about ways that they might um, conceptualize and um, think about their child's gender. Um, it's also very important to bolster public resources, especially because so many transgender people experience discrimination in the workplace. That's led to really an epidemic of homelessness, um, and especially amongst transgender um, youth, and especially also transgender youth of color experience homelessness um, even more than other communities. So bolstering public resources for that community will be very beneficial. Then uh, screening applicants for the foster system. So this goes back to, um, to ensuring that we're creating home environments that will be um, as supportive as possible for um, kids who are gender diverse. Next, if we look to school, there are a number of anti-bullying policies and I am a strong advocate for these, um, especially when they include um, gender-based discrimination. I think it's very important that we include gender and sex-based discrimination in our anti-bullying policies. And then teaching children to accept their transgender and non-binary peers can be a very effective way of showing somebody that they are supported and that they are loved in their community. Finally, continuing on this, um, this realm of, of encouraging support in the community, um, reframing rejection within spiritual communities. I think a lot of people, especially in the LGBT community, have been rejected from a lot of different um, organized religious communities. And if we can start to reframe some of those um, really stigmas that have um, pervaded a lot of organized religion, then I think we can create a really a more robust social support network for young, young people especially. Um, participating in support groups. So this is something that we, um, well, we have on the inpatient psychiatry side, but also we are very supportive of our um, patients being involved in an outpatient basis as well in support groups to um, talk and work with people who are going through similar circumstances. And then um, things like starting new family traditions or rituals by um, perhaps honoring Transgender Day of Visibility or other LGBT pride um, events can be a way to show that you're part of something larger and that your life is um, really valued and celebrated. And then um, the last thing is engaging in online communities. So there's a lot of, um, even one of the papers that we reviewed for our study um, talked about uh, the development of online games, specifically for transgender kids, because it allows for the development of um, an avatar or character that you can make your own and you can make align your align with your gender. Um, and you can create a social sort of milieu within the online space. And that can be really um, empowering and foster a sense of connection for kids who have a really hard time um, with bullying or other forms of rejection in their everyday social lives. All right, we're getting toward the end here. Um, so I wanted to give some, um, some local resources or ways that you can be involved in supporting transgender kids and transgender community in general. Um, Outfront Minnesota is the organization that I've highlighted in this picture here. And they do a lot of advocacy work as well as education and um, anti-violence work um, supporting the LGBT community. Then there's the Minneapolis Transgender Equity Council, the Minnesota Trans Health Coalition, Just Us Health, and Gender Justice, Transforming Families. And here at Mayo Clinic, we have the LGBTI Merge Group, which is the Mayo Employee Resource Group. And that's specifically for LGBT employees, um, both to support each other and connect with each other, but also to educate the rest of the staff um, around the clinic. And then there's also a transgender oral history project that's based out of the University of Minnesota. All right, in order to conclude, I'd like to summarize what we've gone over today. 
So we've talked about some terminology related to sexual and gender identity. We've gone over the developmental timeline of gender identity and gender dysphoria. We've reviewed gender in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is our uh, diagnostic manual in psychiatry and psychology. We've talked about some current research related to transgender mental health, and we've also talked about ways to support and include transgender people. So I hope that this has been informative for you all, and thank you so much for all of your time and attention. And as I said, I would, well, here are my references first. I'd also uh, like to acknowledge Dr. Jennifer Invencil, who um, had a large part in influencing um, this, this presentation today. So I, I would be happy to take any questions or comments that you have at my work email, which is listed here. And um, again, I really appreciate your time and I hope that you have a nice evening. Take care.